Hello and welcome to episode 27 of Radio Cricket. That's 27, the same number of votes that Sachin Tendulkar is likely to receive in the crucial swing state of Ohio. <laughs> yes, it is election week, but I'd like to start off this edition by wishing our American listeners well. Of course, we all know that Hurricane Sandy hit many millions very badly, but don't worry folks, I'm okay. I'm Nishant Joshi, conqueror of hurricanes and vanquisher of cyclones, and I'm joined by a man whose idea of a natural disaster lies somewhere between Richie Benno retiring and Harsha Bogley opening his mouth. It is James Marsh. Well, it's very unkind to suggest Harsha's commentary is a hurricane of nonsense, Nishant, but have you been keeping up on the election anyway? Yeah, I have, James. Uh, speaking of hurricanes of nonsense, I have been following the US elections quite closely. And of course, at Radio Cricket, we do pride ourselves of being impartial and unbiased. But if you are voting today, you only have two options, as I see it. You vote for Barack Obama, or you condemn the world to four years of Romney-Geddon. All logic and rationale should make Obama the obvious candidate for Americans, which is why it seems entirely likely that Americans, in all their Oreo-munching, warmongering wisdom, are going to vote for Romney-Geddon. <laughs> well, I think perhaps they should take a sort of cricketing slant on this, Nishant, and just consider the effect of the two candidates on the world's greatest game. I mean, you know, if you take Obama, he doesn't muck about when it comes to killing the evil heads of globally hated organisations, so it wouldn't bode terribly well for Giles Clark and Kenwin Williams if he wins. <laughs> Romney, on the other hand, is a member of a shadowy cult religion who send people out across the world to spread its propaganda, so I feel he would be well suited to work with Ravi Shastri and Sunil Gavaskar. <laughs> but Nishan, talking about a clash between two mighty heavyweights, we've got Australia versus South Africa starting this week at the Gabba on Friday. So what are your thoughts on this marquee series? Well, yeah, we are going to witness the first test in over two months since the India versus New Zealand test in early September, which does seem like an absolute age ago, particularly when you realise that we've seen 56 T20 matches in a period of 41 days in that time, with the World T20 and Champions League T20 that followed it. I am a big fan of T20s, but it is a strange feeling to have tests back after such a long time. I mean, just like a ginger stepchild, it's hard to forge any sort of emotional connection with T20. It does remind me of a famous incident from The Thick of It, which I know is a favourite show of yours, James, and I'm sure is a fan favourite among our listeners as well. And it was when Steve Fleming said those famous words, You're all emerging from the cellar, pleased that the beatings have stopped, scared of what the future might hold. And that's what, exactly what I feel after two months of T20 and the pure tests coming back for us. So what do you feel about the impending homecoming of test cricket, James? I don't really feel I was beaten by the Champions League, more sort of force-fed Mogadon. But I am glad to see test match cricket back, of course, and particularly so this series, because it does bring to mind the great series between the two sides four years ago, which was memorable for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was South Africa's first ever test series win in Australia. And of course, Mickey Arthur was their coach back then. He's now the Australian coach. It's also the four-year anniversary of the series in which Dale Stain hounded Matthew Hayden out of cricket. He got him three times in three matches and really did make him look like a bit of a doddery old granddad, albeit one that still swears at you repeatedly whilst trying to stamp on your pet rabbit. Anyway, that was the end of Hayden. And also the other point of note from that series was it was the one in which JP Dumini emerged. And he's also a player that I'll be looking out for. Although he performed very well in the test series against England, he averaged 67.5. I think he never really quite got the chance when he'd been brought back into the test side through no fault of his own through the superlative batting ahead of him but Nishan what are the key things that you're going to be looking out for during this series yes well starting off with JP Dumini I'm a huge fan of the guy but as it turns out he is 28 years old and he hasn't even scored a thousand test runs yet he's only played in 16 test matches since his debut uh, in that test series against Australia four years ago which is quite a staggering statistic he has pretty much been an ever-present stalwart in the South African ODI side. He's played 94 ODI since his debut eight years ago, and he averages a very respectable 40 in that format. He does average at 37 in test matches, but it has been characterized by peaks and troughs from series to series, and he hasn't really been able to string a set of scores together, despite the odd gem here and there. But at the end of the day, Dumini is one of those players that South Africa possesses who just really exudes class and quality when he is in form. 
Although when he is a bit out of nick, he can get down on himself quite quickly. And it is a sort of Bapara quandary where you wonder whether he does have the sort of mental strength really needed at test level and whether he can progress from being a really excellent ODI player into an outstanding test player. And really that's all we want to see from Dumini, who really does have the talent to, to take it to the next level. And perhaps maybe he could even reach the le level of Amla and Davilius, but he needs that sort of mental Philip. He kind of needs that sort of mental boost that both Davilius and Amla have had throughout their careers. As I say, Australia are without Cummins, who's sadly broken down again. But of course, they will have Stark and James Pattinson, who took a 5 for against New Zealand, which comprised of New Zealand's top five in his last test at the Gabba. But Nishan, how do you see the pace matchup between the two sides? Well, yes, James, this South African attack is the most feared pace attack since Australia's early 2000 attack of McGrath, Gillespie, Lee and Warren. South Africa right now, they have Dale Stain, Mornay Morkel, Jack Callis, Vernon Philander, and they're likely to go with Imran Tahir in, in for the Gabba as well this week. So they really do have some legends in the making. You've got someone like Dale Stain, who's only three wickets behind Malcolm Marshall at the same stage of his career, essentially a future Hall of Famer guaranteed. And to be honest, James, I can't wait to stay up till 5am again, watching cricket and listening to Mark Nicholas trying to sell me Michael Clarke's jockstrap. <laughs> And in other news, there has been a row brewing, as I'm sure most of you all have heard of. Test Match Special, the revered BBC cricket commentary station, has really been having rather a rude pop at TestMatchSofa.com, which has been its online rival for the past few years. And I believe that James has something to say about that. Well, I have. I mean, I think I come at this from a fairly even-handed view. I do like both of these commentaries. I mean, I think it's a question of lemon cake and a glass of rosé in a sun-dappled conservatory against a lager-infused evening at a pub with a particularly well-informed bunch of locals. But I think it's perfectly possible to enjoy both Test Match Special and Test Match Sofa without being overcome with cognitive dissonance, Nishan. I was chatting with Jonathan Agnew on Twitter Twitter about this last Friday morning, despite the fact I was trying to prepare quite a complicated breakfast at the time, and his main point is that cricket benefits from exclusivity of rights because Sky and the BBC pay a premium to the ECB to secure sole distribution, and then the ECB invests that money in the British cricketing community. I think that is a fair point in terms of the seemingly well-regarded way the ECB spends money on cricket, but I think it's also rather a parochial one, and particularly so when we extend it to cover internet broadcast rights, which I think, personally, the cricket's real Pandora's box. You and I, Nishant, both come at this from a slightly loftier, some might say aloof <laughs> position, if you will, because we're blessed to live in the Czech Republic. So even if we want to pay to watch cricket on Sky over the internet, we can't. And whether you can listen to Test Match Special here seems to be a really a matter of chance. Sometimes you can, and sometimes you get four-year episodes of radio Radio 5 football phone-in. But anyway, the point is, the good of cricket doesn't just extend to Britain and Ireland, where you can legally access Sky, or to the other countries to who they might sell their pictures if you're lucky enough to live in those. If you live outside these nations and want to watch cricket, you're screwed, unless you're prepared to faff about watching a grainy stream, which is about as reliable as Pat Cummins' spine. So, Nishan, I don't know where you stand on this. For me, exclusivity just seems to mean exclusion for the vast majority majority of cricket fans around the world so what do you think oh i i totally agree with the opinion that it does seem to be a bit of a case of the bbc talking down to the rest of us from their from their glass houses as you mentioned it is kind of cricket's pandora's box because if you start policing online commentary then where do you stop does it mean that we can't commentate over twitter as well does it mean that we're not even allowed to have this podcast God forbid. So, <laughs> I mean, it is basically a, a rabbit hole, which, to be honest, I feel that the BBC are kind of digging their own graves. And on that point, I've had many fans, young fans, tell me on Twitter this week, they've kind of been alienated by Agnew's comments because they have been very arrogant in their view towards new media, social media, and it kind of feels like they're talking down to us. And to be honest, even though I kind of have grown up with Test Match Special to some extent, I really do wonder whether in five to ten years, with the advent of Twitter, Facebook, and all this new sort of social media, will Test Match Special exist in its current form in a few years' time? 
And that brings us to the end of another episode of Radio Cricket. Thank you very much for joining us once again. I leave you with the news that Ravi Shastri has sadly filed for divorce. I guess that partnership was just not what the doctor ordered. I've been Nishant Joshi. And I've been James Marsh. Goodbye. I think it was a very poor performance. One of the worst things I have ever seen done on a cricket field. Good night.